One thing that investors love are stories. We love narratives. We love the story of a stock. And that's not a bad thing. I like stories as well. I invest in companies based on their story. According to Peter Lynch, a story of a stock is a way to follow and monitor a company's progress. So you believe that a story is going to unfold over the next five to 10 years. That's how you can monitor whether or not this stock is keeping with its story. Now online, there's lots of different narratives and stories competing with each other. They're passed around different YouTube videos. They're on CNBC. They're on Reddit and X or Twitter. They're on Instagram. They're on Discord chats. They're everywhere. Everyone's competing with different stories, creating different narratives. And in some cases, some narratives start to take market share. They start to win out against the other competing stories or narratives to the point where almost everything passed around online is like a consensus, this consensus story of what's going to happen with different industries or different stocks. One consensus that I've seen, and this is a story that I've seen repeated over and over again, on CNBC, on Twitter, everywhere you look, it's the story of AI and the companies that will win in AI. We have NVIDIA. This is clear as day. We all know NVIDIA is like the big AI company. It's the, the winner in AI. It's the one that's benefited the most. That's one of the narratives that's being passed around right now. And I don't necessarily think that's false. And then the other AI winners on almost every list, every CNBC article, every Barron's, are other stocks like Google. Google's another big potential winner from AI. We know they have Gemini, they have the cloud hosting, they have all of these different aspects in AI. Of course, they have Google search and they've had an AI team for a long period of time. And then we also have Microsoft. Microsoft with Copilot and with Satya Nadella, carefully pivoting with ChatGPT, he has made Microsoft into a so-called AI winner. And this has been the story of the market over the past year. Microsoft, Google, and NVIDIA are big AI winners. Now you could throw in a couple other companies that are mixed in once in a while. Maybe Palantir, that's another AI winner. But overall, these are the three big ones that I see mentioned continuously in AI. NVIDIA, Google, and Microsoft. And this story has become a consensus. You can see it online. Almost any time AI is mentioned in conjunction with stocks, there's only a couple stocks mentioned. NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, and maybe Meta or Palantir. The same handful of companies over and over and over again. We see this so frequently that it's just paired together. They're matched together. AI means these companies and these companies mean AI. This is how a consensus is formed. This is how this singular version of thinking is formed. And what I'd like to do in this video is prove this narrative false and illustrate to you that these are not the only companies that will meaningfully benefit from artificial intelligence. I wanna broaden your horizon, your view of the type of ways that artificial intelligence will impact different companies in different industries. And I actually believe that maybe aside from NVIDIA, there's other companies that will benefit even more than Microsoft and Google and Meta in artificial intelligence. Two companies that are often left out of the mix that I wanna use as examples are Netflix and Amazon. Neither of them have large language models. There's no Amazon GPT. Netflix isn't in the game of answering queries or having text chats. And so these companies are often pushed aside in the artificial intelligence discussions. But in this video, I wanna use these as examples of companies that I see dramatic improvements in their business because of AI. Now, I wanna be clear about something here. I own both Amazon and Netflix, so I'm invested in these companies. I view them very positively. I like the stocks, but even so, this is not going to be an investment thesis on Amazon or Netflix. The purpose of this video is not to be a bull case on these companies. I've done that in the past. You can watch prior videos. I'm not gonna repeat myself on the investment thesis of Amazon or Netflix. The goal of this video is to expand our horizon on the implications that artificial intelligence has on different companies, ones that are not mentioned in many conversations. And I think Netflix and Amazon are the perfect opportunity because again, they're just left out of the mix. These companies aren't really discussed when it comes to artificial intelligence. Now, before I go over examples of how Amazon is benefiting from AI, I think it would be helpful to understand what AI actually is, because the term is often misused, or at least it's a very broad term, and there's different aspects to AI. For example, the more recent, I think, exciting part of AI 
has been generative AI. Generative AI is a branch of AI that uses machine learning techniques to generate new content that mimics the data it was trained on. The key word there is generate. So anything with generative AI means that it has a big output. It's not only taking in data and learning from it, like machine learning techniques, but it's putting something out there. Whether it's new images, text, audio, video, it still learns from all the past like an algorithm, but it's generating something new for the user. This is what has excited a lot of people. Now, because generative AI is more seen by customers and it's more seen by users, it means that a lot of people connect AI with just generative AI. They think anything done with artificial intelligence is generative artificial intelligence. But that's not the case. There's a whole other aspect of AI called machine learning. And this is perhaps even broader and more important than generative AI. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that uses algorithms to analyze data, learn from it, and make predictions and inform decisions based on the data. Instead of needing to explicitly program every single rule of how a computer should behave, machine learning algorithms are designed to automatically learn and improve from experience. The ML models learn by examining training data and using statistical techniques to identify patterns, extract insights, and find relationships between inputs and outputs. This is algorithms. This is machine learning. This is a huge part of artificial intelligence. It's the foundation in which generative AI actually generates new things. But even if you don't actually generate something, even if you don't do something that the end user can see, many companies benefit or can benefit from improved machine learning. This aspect of artificial intelligence is still making a lot of progress. This is the foundation of artificial intelligence. So when we look at these different examples here, they can bounce between generative AI and machine learning. But don't be mistaken, just because a company doesn't use the generative part of AI, just because they're not giving the user a direct output of an image or text, does not mean that they're not using AI. They can very well be benefiting their end customer in various ways behind the scenes with artificial intelligence that the customer never sees. And I think that that actually makes up more use cases of AI than the generation. Now, if we look at the examples of Amazon, they have various ways where they're doing it both with generative AI and machine learning. And there's many ways they're benefiting customers. One of them, obviously, which is a more direct way of generative AI, is Alexa. It's the voice assistant. They've sold over half a billion Alexa devices. So 500 million plus of them, they're in like every household, right? I have like a bunch of them, you know, one in the kitchen. And Alexa just isn't great at giving you in-depth understanding and answering in-depth questions quite yet. But Amazon is dead set on making this far more capable. They say that we're previewing a new large language model and a suite of conversational capabilities that will help deliver an even more intuitive, intelligent, and useful Alexa. They're going to make Alexa far better and far more conversational with large language models. Even Jeff Bezos on a recent Lex Friedman podcast, when asked about the implications of AI on Amazon, he said, well, Alexa is going to get a lot better. So that is number one. Alexa is going to get much better over the next couple of years. You know that Amazon's going to implement large language models like ChatGPT or Gemini, but Amazon's version of it, and all of a sudden update all of their devices. That could be a massive improvement for something that's already in people's houses. That's gonna be one of the few ways that you see Amazon benefiting customers, that you visually see it as a consumer. But there's other ways that are more behind the scenes. For example, Amazon is launching a generative AI to help sellers write product descriptions. This is something the customer doesn't really see directly. They're not gonna see that AI is there benefiting the listings, but they'll just notice from the other side. Sellers will go on, They'll have different products they want to list, and Amazon is making it so that the AI will look at the product and help them write good descriptions of the product that better inform the customer. Now, again, Amazon has blogs detailing out all the different technicalities of how they're doing this. There's a ton of thought that goes into this. I don't have time to go over all of it here, but this will help improve millions of product listings on Amazon. Amazon is also rolling out an AI-powered image generation to help advertisers deliver a better ad for customers. 
People often mention Google and Meta in the advertising category, and they forget that Amazon is the third largest ad company in the world. The amount of sponsored listings and how competitive Amazon's online marketplace is, is insane. And the fact that they're implementing, at scale, generative AI images that will help create advertisements for products is going to have a massive impact. Think about the incremental impact this can have on their product listings. You can take one good image of a product and then they can automatically fill in different backgrounds and contexts. This is something that you would normally have to do with Photoshop. You'd have to go in and I'd have to edit the background and use the little pen tool to outline the shampoo bottle here and then add in the beach or the water or whatever you want to add in. Now you're going to be able to just say, I want all these different backgrounds. And it's not going to be a simple template. This is going to be auto-generated with AI. This is another, another real-world example of how Amazon's going to benefit from it. New AI-generated customer review highlights are the latest in a string of review innovations. Review innovations and review validity is a huge part of what Amazon's focusing on. They want to get rid of fake reviews, they want to have really good, authentic reviews, and they want to have the customer to be able to understand the reviews. That's a big advantage that Amazon has over physical retailers. Think about going into a physical retailer. You go into a Walmart, a Target, there might be an item that you're looking at, but you're not quite sure about the reviews on it. Is this shirt made of a good fabric? Does it shrink a lot after you wash it? Uh, you know, different items in different stores you're unsure about, and you can't read reviews. With Amazon online, that's a huge advantage. You can read about the experiences other people had when buying the same item, making it more likely that you're going to get something that will last for you that you really can enjoy. But in some cases, it's overwhelming. In some cases, there's so many reviews that it's hard to really find out what the real consensus is. What is the real experience with this item? And that's where generative AI comes in to reviews. I can show you an example, the example of Celsius. I tried Celsius Sal, it's not a drink for me. I, I ordered a, a package of it and I ended up giving a few, but I think it's a cool company. The stock is also out of control. So great stock, I think a great product, not personally for me, but that's aside from the point. If we look at the reviews of Celsius on Amazon, which this company sells a ton of these drinks. So they have 91,000 reviews and they're selling, this is astronomical, they're selling 90,000 plus in a month every single month on Amazon. So there's so many reviews that you can't possibly read through these reviews. You're gonna spend time sifting through 90,000 reviews? Impossible. It would take years to do it. But here we have something right here that I think is just an awesome implementation of generative AI. Customers say that they like the low calorie, zero sugar Celsius energy drinks. They say it helps them burn more calories and lose weight. They also say it provides a powerful punch of energy without a crash. Customers are also happy with the taste. However, some customers differ on caffeine content, carbonation, quality, and value. This is auto, uh, this is AI generated from text of customer reviews. So the way that this works, if you look at the technicalities in Amazon's blog, how they break it down, is the artificial intelligence obviously goes through all the different reviews, looking at all the text, it uses its large language model, and it tries to write the most unbiased, well-rounded, concise summary of the reviews, giving you both the most common highlights and the most common complaints. So you're getting both sides of it. They have the part where some customers differ, but the majority of them really like it, which is exactly what the star rating is like, right? The majority of, of, of the ratings are, are a five star. So this accurately summarizes, I think in a very accurate way, the number of reviews and what people's experiences are. And keep in mind that this is something that they didn't have before. When you scroll down to the review section, there was no summary. You just had to read through recent reviews, which was impossible. And there's no way that they could also hire an employee to do this. How could Amazon possibly do this without AI? You're gonna hire a thousand different employees to sweep through hundreds of thousands of reviews on millions of items. So Amazon has way too many items with way too many reviews to have any type of team of people hired to go through and make these type of summaries. It's simply impossible. But with generative AI, they give you a nice concise summary of the reviews. They have nice little tags that are generated from the text showing you the taste is good the energy drink, refreshing and calories, the quality and value and carbonation is, is more of a debate 
right? They highlight in green the parts that are unanimous, and then they put the parts in gray that are a little bit more of a debate. And this is going to get better and better over time, using generative AI to benefit millions of customers and strengthen one of the biggest parts of Amazon, which is their reviews. This is a part that I really think distinguishes them from physical retail. Now, again, Amazon is forgotten in these discussions. They're not really talked about as an AI winner. They're almost included in no conversations. And this just continues on. We have the example of football. Amazon is using AI to create once unimaginable enhancements to football viewing experience. Amazon is helping to make it possible through killer combinations of in-house machine learning and AI capabilities, prime videos production and engineering expertise, and a powerful backbone of Amazon Web Services. Next-gen stats powered by AWS provides a wealth of insights through real-time data capture of location, speed, acceleration for every player on the field. So they're using visual machine learning to gauge the speed at which different players are running and then giving you these next gen stats that they could no way otherwise provide. Sensors throughout the stadium track tags concealed within each player's shoulder pads. But first they need to be teased out from a mountain of data each game it generates. So they have all this data and they need to extract all this information from it. We're collecting more than 300 million data points per second, said Julie from the uh, uh, Sports Global Professional Services at AWS. This level of data is powering our machine learning models to gain new insights from every game. That helps us understand the sport better. And that's what we're sharing with our viewers. So even football is benefiting from AI. Amazon is using machine learning, tons of data and sensors, AWS and generative AI to make football experiences different and more unique and better for their customers, for their, their users. Yet, this is another example out of many. I could continue on with Amazon. I could list off another five examples, but you get the point. I don't want to belabor it. The point is that Amazon's not included in the talks of the AI companies. The AI companies are Google and Microsoft, maybe Meta, Palantir, and NVIDIA. Those are the companies that are included in that conversation over and over again. Do you ever hear Amazon as a top AI company? Not frequently. It's usually left out because it doesn't have the large language model in the same way. Even though it's not the case, Amazon is implementing AI with every single thing they're doing. There is example after example of how customers will meaningfully benefit, how Amazon will become more efficient. This isn't to mention all the stuff with AWS. They're doing a ton of stuff with AWS as well. They're doing stuff in their factories with robotics and implementing more uh, efficiency throughout their factories, all using artificial intelligence. Yet it's not part of the story. Remember how important stories are. The market has a story that there's only a handful of AI companies and these ones aren't included. Now, I wanna continue on and we're gonna switch gears over from Amazon to Netflix. This is another one where you don't hear it mentioned frequently in the discussion of artificial intelligence because it's not part of the prevailing narrative or the prevailing story that Netflix is an AI company. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few examples here. One blog that I've followed for years because I have a background in programming is the Netflix tech blog. This is a company that has blogged about all the different advancements they're doing with technology, engineering, all the different backend stuff they're doing, all the front end stuff they're doing with their website. They blog all the progress with their engineering. Now I'm nowhere near this level. So it's a lot of it's even above my head. It's way above anything that I've worked on but it's still awesome to read about. I love learning about this type of stuff. One thing that I've noticed over the past couple of years is how much Netflix focuses on machine learning. They've been doing this for a long period of time. One more recent post that I thought was very interesting is what they call a framework to identify the casual impact of successful visual components. That is a very kind of complex, long-winded way to say that they wanna improve their thumbnails. We know that thumbnails are important. Look at Mr. Beast. He's like the king of making thumbnails on YouTube. In every interview, he talks about how half the video should be spent on making the content, the other half on the thumbnail, just to emphasize how important thumbnails are. People don't click on your videos, they don't watch them, they don't consume the content, they gain nothing from it. So getting people to click is the most important part of the game. Now, you have to back up the clicks with good content, but you have to get people to click first. Mr. Beast understands that. And that's why his thumbnails are so bright and vivid and clickable. They're just clickable thumbnails. Well, Netflix seems to understand this as well. They have a lot of content, and in some cases, they have good content that doesn't get clicked because people judge a story 
by its cover. They judge the book by its cover and they don't click on a movie because it doesn't have an intriguing thumbnail. Well, Netflix is trying to fix this not through personal preference and not through manual work, but through science, data, and engineering. This is where Netflix differs from a lot of competitors. They are way ahead on optimizing their library for visual content and making every thumbnail clickable. Here's a video of them illustrating their effort and progress in this category. At Netflix, we want to give our members exactly what they need to find their next favorite title. One way we can do this is by designing artwork that best represents each movie and TV show featured on our platform. Since it's the first image our members are seeing, it's important we nail it. But with such a vast library of content, that's a lot easier said than done. So we asked ourselves, what if we could empower our creative teams to easily identify the visual components that make the best performing artwork? To get anywhere close, we needed a framework to examine the causal impact of different creative components on an artwork's success. They created a framework to examine the causal impact of creative components on artwork success. That's how scientific they're getting in thumbnails. So if you, you just think from the customer perspective, you look at a Netflix, you open it up, and you think, oh, there's some artwork they included with, with the episodes, right? Just some artwork, not the case. There is science and data behind every single piece of, of information you're getting. And your screen with your thumbnails may look entirely different than someone else's screen with their thumbnails, even if they're, they're presenting the same shows. This is how scientific Netflix gets with their thumbnails. While also considering an endless number of visual factors like shot type, number of people, figure orientation, color profile, font size, face size, facial expression, brightness, saturation, composition, and on and on. Through this same lens, we also needed to efficiently examine Netflix's vast and diverse collection of existing artwork. Otherwise, we wouldn't be getting the full picture. So how did we turn artwork into insights? With algorithms. By using Netflix's rich data sets and tools like causal inference, machine learning, and computer vision, we are able to gather image metadata and analyze engagement patterns on our platform. In other words, we are learning which visual factors lead to a title's artwork, compelling our members to press play or not. Without this data-driven framework, we may not be able to see the real reasons why our artwork is hitting or missing the mark. But with it, we can give our creative team actionable insights to set their designs up to connect with members. What used to be a never-ending guessing game is now a lot more likely to end in a watch now. Netflix has boiled down every single visual aspect of a thumbnail into a science using algorithms and AI. And they've done this behind the scenes. Unless you're reading the blog, you'd have no clue. Most customers have no clue. They just realize that Netflix's presentation is a little bit better than the competition. Why is it a little bit better than the competition? Well, we don't know. The real reason is, is because companies like Paramount and Disney are simply just making default thumbnail art and hoping you click. They don't have anywhere close to this level of science behind what they're doing. They're too far behind right now. Now they're trying to improve their presentation as well, but this illustrates how one company using AI can have an advantage in its industry over other companies in a way that customers and even most investors have no clue about. Most people do not know that Netflix is this science driven. And again, these are things that are just like experiments that may be used in the future, potentially. These are things actively being used today for the company at scale that they're iteratively progressing on. Another example of this is visual search. As you know, you can search text really easy, but it's difficult to search different parts of a video based on text. That's what they've also created a solution for. And today we have come to another turning point where the editor can tap into the power of machine learning. We have designed space for the creative user. With our new visual search tool, we can now search for any scene we want at any- You see that they have a search bar. They can type in basically anything they want and it will scan through their entire library or what they segment that they want it to scan through. And it will show you different scenes and it will lay them out like a grid, different scenes that have that search term. So for example, if you're wanting to make a, a trailer for Ozark and you wanna show a car crash, you can say, I, I want to select Ozark and then type in car crash. And it will bring up only the scenes where there's a car crash in Ozark. This is technology that helps them build trailers. It helps them build clips. It helps them do things on social media. That's a huge advantage opposed to 
what you would normally have to do, which is manually searching through an episode. And they continue on behind the science of creating this. They use artificial intelligence to run through all of it and attach different keywords to every scene and every part of a show. Today, an editor's job must be technically sound and bold in the creative process, but finding the perfect shot can be time consuming. This is our Netflix editor, John. John has been given the task of building a trailer for a new action thriller and looking for something in the film that stands out. John is now empowered with a catalog of action footage in seconds. To build such a visual search engine, we needed a system that can understand a substantial number of visual elements. Our early attempts included object detection, but we needed more. We developed a system that tapped into our catalog with contrast learning to maximize our searching capabilities. Then, to fine-tune the image text model, we leveraged our in-house data that pairs shots with rich textual descriptions. This machine learning tool can find novel scenes and recognizable objects amongst hundreds of thousands of movies and TV shows. So Netflix has created a system where their editors can not only search things by keyword, but they can also search things by color and contrast ratios, finding happy scenes or sad scenes. When they put together trailers, instead of having someone manually look through the entire movie and find punchy lines that would be good for a trailer, they can literally say, I wanna find punchy lines. And the AI will go through the entire movie and find the different punchy lines in the movie that they can potentially use in a trailer, speeding up the entire editing process and making their edits better. So again, when you view Netflix on the surface, doesn't look like an AI company. How would it have any meaningful advantage with AI? But once you start diving in to all the different write-ups, the blogs, what's going on behind the scenes, you realize that this is a scaled company with hundreds of millions of subscribers using AI in every aspect of their company to give them a competitive advantage over other companies that don't have as many developers, that their developers are a little bit behind, that they haven't had as long building out these tools. Netflix is far and away the leader in these categories. And even outside of understanding thumbnails and presentation and editing with visual search, there's other big ways that I think that artificial intelligence is going to increasingly impact content, especially the type of content that Netflix creates. But there's also ways that generative AI can impact Netflix in the future. For example, this scene here, I forget the movie. I think it's Fall. They like climb a tower and then the ladder falls off and they don't have cell phone reception. So they're stuck up here on a tower. And this is an illustration of how, how generative AI can potentially impact content creation in the future. Let's go full screen here and I'll just play this. Now we're stuck on this stupid tower in the middle of nowhere. That is the original. That's the R-rated version of this shot. Now we switch from the R-rated version and we edit her face to make it look like she's not saying anything at all. And I don't blame you and now we're stuck on this stupid That is dialogue removal. They removed the dialogue and made her lips and mouth look as though that was original. That's what originally happened. Now imagine you wanna change this movie from the R-rated version to a PG-13 movie. Stuck on this stupid freaking tower in the middle of freaking nowhere. This face masking technology took what she said and took it from a mature rating of saying the F word down to a PG-13 rating saying freaking. And her lips matched and her voice matched, but she never said freaking, so how did they match her voice? We can continue on with this. They have another version here where it's her talking in different languages. <laughs> So what we're seeing here is content that's being changed from its original R-rated, using the F word, to removing the dialogue completely, to changing it down to a PG-13 rating, which broadens the appeal for different viewers. So there's real use cases here. If there's an R-rated movie that they wanna preserve the R rating, but they also wanna have the option to have a more family-friendly version of it, then they could on the fly change it down to a PG-13 rating. Then you also have the different language debacle. We know that many people speak different languages. My YouTube channel has over 50% of the people outside of the US. So lots of people speaking different languages. We obviously have implications of artificial intelligence that can on the fly change the dialogue from English to Spanish, Japanese, or whatever language you speak. And not only do that, but there's potential down the road for it to change your lips to match the new language and for the language to be spoken in the voice of the actor. So it's not a third party person acting it out, changing the voice of the, the actor. 
It's generative AI changing their voice in their language, but it still sounds just like them. Now, the tool that did this particular clip is called Flawless. It's an AI-powered filmmaking tool. So this isn't specifically from Netflix, but this is something people are actively working on. That clip did take humans to interact. They had to do some face masking and manipulation. So that wasn't 100% AI, but you get the idea here. This could be the direction things move. And in fact, I think it is the direction things are moving. More AI-powered tools, making it far easier for editors to change different faces and scenes so that audiences can be much broader for different pieces of content. This is something where so many people will benefit. Actors and writers will benefit because they always want the most views possible. They want the biggest reach with their content. And this gives them broader reach. Customers will of course benefit because it's more fun in some cases to watch things in your own language than reading dubs or listening to it in someone else's voice. Having it in your own language and in the actor's voice is a huge benefit for customers. And of course, Netflix will benefit. As they broaden their appeal and grow outside of the US, they need to make the content made within the US as attractive as possible to people outside of the US. So this broadens and benefits almost everyone involved. All of this is going to have a changing and improving impact on the world and their consumption of entertainment, driven by the top companies that implement AI at scale. And again, the purpose of this video is not to convince you that Netflix or Amazon in particular are a good investment. That's not what I'm trying to do here. What I'm trying to do is counteract this prevailing narrative that the same groups of companies you hear over and over again, Google and Microsoft and Nvidia are the only great AI plays. They're the only companies using artificial intelligence. That's just simply not true. I could go through many other companies that are going to benefit dramatically from AI. Amazon and Netflix are just two examples, but there's other ones, other ones out there that will benefit dramatically. So hopefully this was an informative look at artificial intelligence. Hopefully this broadens our horizon a little bit that we can have a bigger discussion other than the few that are mentioned with AI. That's all for this episode. If you want more content, you can check out the Patreon. Other than that, I'll see you in the next one.